Welcome um, and thank you all so much for joining us um, this evening for this extraordinary lineup here at 5 by 15 and we're delighted to have hundreds of people signed up for this evening but not surprised as we are welcoming such an extraordinary and acclaimed group of writers and storytellers, artists and scientists and covering an incredibly broad range of topics from exploring the building blocks of life to medical mysteries, the mental health crisis in this country, the magic of one of our most reclusive and beautiful birds and an extraordinary family story. So sit back and enjoy this event. Please tweet us if you can, if you feel like it, and please support our speakers and our writers by buying their books. If you're in the UK, then you can always purchase from our book partner, New and Bookshop. So first up, joining us from America is the fabulous Walter Isaacson, who wowed the 5 by 15 audience when he spoke to us about Steve Jobs some years ago. He's an acclaimed biographer, uh, not only of Jobs, but also of Albert Einstein and Leonardo da Vinci and others. And now he's returning with The Codebreaker, Jennifer Doudner, Gene Editing and the Future of Human Life, which describes the world changing gene editing invention CRISPR and the woman behind it. So Walter is a professor at Tulane University. He's a former chair of C um, and CEO of CNN, and he is a former editor of Time magazine. He's been leading the bestseller charts in America, and it is a huge honor to have Walter back with us again at 5 by 15, and I hand over to him now. Welcome. Thank you very much, Daisy, and it's great to be back. I come from New Orleans. And one of my mentors was a novelist who said there are two types of people who come out of New Orleans, preachers and storytellers. And he said, for heaven's sake, be a storyteller. The world has too many preachers. And that's why I love five by 15. When I was a young student down here in school, uh, I came home one day and found on my bed a book called The Double Helix that my father, who was a scientist, had left for me. Of course, it was a story that James Watson had written about the discovery of the structure of DNA. I was pretty fascinated. I even found my old copy and written in the margin. I defined words that were new to me, such as uh, biochemistry. Uh, but as it turned out, I never really pursued biology as much as I thought I was going to. I grew up in the digital age and was very interested in computers and digital coding rather than genetic coding. And in my career, I ended up writing books, including Steve Jobs, the one that Daisy mentioned, about the digital revolution. However, about a decade ago, I began to realize that the advances of the digital revolution were going to pale in comparison to the revolution that was going to occur in the first half of this century, the first half of the 21st century, which was a life sciences revolution in which molecules will become the new microchip. We'll be able to program them, program them to do things, to make vaccines for the coronavirus and to edit our genes and to do all sorts of things that we used to only uh, dream or have nightmares about. And I met a woman named Jennifer Doudna and she too told me the story of finding the double helix on her bed when she came home from school one day. And she read it and she noticed a character in it that I hadn't paid much attention to named Rosalind Franklin, who had done the imaging work that allowed Watson and Crick to figure out the structure of DNA. And she told me that up until then, she had not realized that women could become scientists. And so she told her school guidance counselor she wanted to be a scientist. And the guidance counselor in Hawaii, which is where she grew up, said, no, 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 girls don't become scientists. Well, that made her persist. And she also learned to pursue things that the others in science, especially the men, weren't pursuing. Because when she was in the graduate school in the 1990s, most of the men were pursuing DNA, that molecule that's at the heart of the double helix, and that encodes our genes and uh, passes them along to future generations. But Jennifer was more interested in RNA, sort of the not very famous uh, sibling of DNA. 
But like a lot of famous uh, siblings, DNA actually doesn't do much work. It just sits in the nucleus of our cell, curating our genetic information. What RNA does is it goes in there, takes a little snippet of gene uh, or of coding, and goes and builds proteins in the outer region of our cell. It actually make thing, makes things. Jennifer was able to s discover the structure of RNA, just like Watson and Crick and Rosalind Franklin discovered the structure of DNA. And uh, her professor told her, always ask the big questions. And she said, what's the big question here? And he said, how did life begin on this planet? And she was able to show how RNA can copy itself. And thus it was the molecule four billion years ago that started replicating and began life on this planet. As a student of RNA, she got introduced to something called CRISPR. There was another woman scientist at Berkeley who had been studying these clustered repeated sequences that can be found in bacteria. And they were kind of mysterious. I mean, why would bacteria repeat sequences of their genetic code? And they eventually discovered that it was the way that uh, bacteria fought viruses. They would take a mugshot of any virus that attacked them and put them in these CRISPR sequences in their own genetic code. So if the virus ever attacked again, boom, the bacteria could chop it up using a scissors, using an enzyme. Uh, that's a pretty useful thing to know in this era of coronavirus. And when Jennifer Dowd started looking at it, she and a French biologist she had met in Puerto Rico said, we're going to figure out a way to repurpose this system bacteria have been using for 3 billion years and use it to cut our own DNA. We can, we can program the guide RNA. So instead of cutting up the, a virus, it could also cut our own genetic code and make edits in what we are. And that's what won them the Nobel Prize in 2012, creating a system called CRISPR that allows us to edit our own genes. Now, after she did that, she had a nightmare. And the nightmare was that somebody wanted to learn about her new technology. And she walked into the room to meet the person. And when the person looked up, it was Hitler. And so Jennifer gathered groups of scientists over the past few years in order to figure out the ethical uses of CRISPR. They've already used it, her tool uh, and the one that Emmanuel Charpentier developed with her to cure sickle cell anemia, which is a dreadful genetic disease with, with only a one letter mutation. And now people have been cured of that. There are many easy genetic diseases that are gonna be cured in the next few years. Other blood diseases will even be able to fight cancers that way. But the ethical issue comes in when instead of doing it in a patient who can give consent, you do it in sperm or eggs or reproductive cells or early embryos so that the edits are inheritable. They're passed down over the generation. You've edited the human species. And everybody thought, well, nobody's going to do that right away. But two years ago in China, a rogue scientist edited the early stage embryos of what became twin girls in order to take out the receptor for HIV, uh, the virus that causes AIDS. And there was a huge outcry, people fighting against that happening. And the Chinese, Americans and British under Jennifer Doudna and other people gathering them have put in a rule. They arrested the scientists in China and put in a rule that you can't now make inheritable edits. But once we got hit with the coronavirus, you know, people began to say, wait a minute, remind me again what's wrong with editing the human species so that we're less susceptible to viruses? And uh, don't every creature, large and small, in God's creation, use every trick in its playbook to help make sure that it thrives as a species? Why wouldn't we do inheritable edits if it can help us? So that led to the moral questions I try to explore in this book. Maybe there are some inheritable edits to get rid of sickle cell, maybe to fight viruses. 
Jennifer Doudna and her team were able to use this CRISPR technology to make virus detection kits for coronavirus, to make antivirals, and of course, the ability to code a piece of RNA as a messenger has been used to code so that it makes a part of the spike protein of the coronavirus in our own cells. And that's how we get the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. But what we're going to have to do is figure out when should we not use this technology in the future? And for me, there are two particular thoughts I would have and leave you with. One, is if we do it, it has to be fair and equitably distributed. We don't want the rich to be able to go and buy better genes for their children. Not only would that exacerbate the inequality we already have, it would encode it into our species. Just like in the novel Brave New World or the movie Gattaca. And the second thing is I worry about taking out some of the diversity that makes our species both colorful and creative and perhaps even resilient. The balcony right behind me, you see those doors, it opens to Royal Street here in the French Quarter of New Orleans. And I remember as I was finishing the book, sitting on that balcony and looking down at the passing parade of humanity as New Orleans came back to life as coronavirus receded here. And there were people tall and short and fat and skinny and black and white and Creole color and every different hue and gay and straight and trans. And some were even deaf from Gallaudet University doing sign language. And I think that if we allowed everybody to say, I'm gonna edit my children this way, we'd be at risk sometimes of losing that flavorful diversity, that natural lottery that sort of says, hey, I've been gifted with what I have and I'm empathetic to other people. So as we move forward, I hope we can do this slowly, step by step, figuring out when we're gonna gene edit our children and our species. And it's a slippery slope. So that's why we got to do it cautiously, step by step, and preferably hand in hand. Thank you all very much. Walter, thank you so much. We're so um, delighted to have you back at 5 by 15 and so glad that you became a storyteller and not a preacher. And congratulations on Code, the Code Breaker. Um, it's out now and I hope that all of our audience will pick up a copy and discover more about this incredibly thought provoking and important topic to think about and to um, discuss amongst ourselves. And thank you for being with us from New Orleans. Um, and we'll see you again soon, we hope. Um, I look forward to listening to all the other speakers. It sounds like a great evening. Thank you for, thank you. for having me. Thanks, Walt. So next this evening, we welcome Suzanne O'Sullivan, who is a longtime friend of 5x15, a leading neurologist and winner of the Welcome Book Prize for her amazing book, It's All in Your Head. Her new book is called The Sleeping Beauties. Um, I have it here. And it's an investigation into communities struck by seemingly inexplicable illnesses inspired by the sleeping refugee children of Sweden. And it's taken Suzanne all around the world from Kazakhstan to Colombia um, to Nicaragua to look into these incredibly um, mysterious cases. And as Satnam Sangira has said, Suzanne is a true descendant of Oliver Sacks. And it is a huge honor for us to have her with us this evening. And as if all of that really wasn't enough being a leading neurologist and a best-selling writer, she's also been volunteering in the ITU this year. So we salute you, Suzanne. And thank you very much for being with us. And um, over to you. Hi there. So um, I want to tell you two stories. So the first story was told to me by Courtney, who is an American anthropologist, and it's set in a small town in Guyana called Sand Creek. So the background to this story is that in very small remote villages in Guyana, girls sometimes have difficulty accessing secondary level education. So the government set up a um, system to rectify that by putting a boarding school in this small town called Sand Creek. And Courtney went there to study the uh, effect of that educational program. But when she was in there, she stumbled on something she was not expecting. Shortly after she arrived, she realized that girls were disappearing from the school. Now, the first time this happened, she was told by some of the girls, original girls' classmates that Granny had come for her. And when she asked the other teachers, she was told the girl had fallen ill and she'd been taken back to her village 
by her family. Now, Courtney assumed that the illness was something, you know, a tropical illness like malaria, but she started to become sort of uncomfortable as girl after girl disappeared. And this sort of specter of granny coming for the girls kept entering the picture in a very ominous way. It wasn't until Courtney had been in the town to, for long enough for the people to trust her that she discovered what was actually happening, which is that the girls had developed contagious seizures. So they were going into a frenzy of convulsions. They had to be locked in the dormitory to protect them. And this was spreading from girl to girl like a virus. What's more, this had been going on in, um, in Sand Creek and in Guyana for a long time. It had been extensively medically investigated. Tests were normal. One group actually called in an American psychologist to examine what was happening, and they declared that this was a case of mass hysteria. Now, the Sand Creek people took this as a grievous insult, and they rejected that formulation. They preferred to come up with their own explanation for what was happening. Granny, as it turned out, was not a sort of kindly old matriarch. She was a spirit that lived in the mountains behind the school, and they believed that the, one of the school children must have upset Granny and that she had come to the school to infect them. Now, the second story occurs in an equally small town, thousands of miles away, this time in Kazakhstan, a place called Krasnogorsk, and it was told to me by Lyubov. So in 2010, when Lyubov was in her late 60s, she was working on a market stall in Krasnogorsk when she fell asleep, and the other people in the market couldn't wake her. She was taken to hospital, she had lots of tests, it was all very inexplicable, she, the doctors couldn't wake her and she stayed in that state for a week before just spontaneously waking up. Then, much like in Sand Creek, this spread from person to person in the town. Within five years, 133 people had developed a mysterious coma. Now, the scientists in Kazakhstan went into overdrive. You know, they did every test possible, every environmental and medical test and found nothing. Once again, a diagnosis of mass hysteria was mooted. Once again, it was rejected by the people. They believe strongly that they were a victim of a poisoning campaign by the government who wanted to clear the town. No poison has ever been found. Now, what these both of these groups were, were told that they had mass hysteria, and that's a medical phenomenon in which you get a spread of psychosomatic symptoms, which are propagated by fear and anxiety. And psychosomatic symptoms are real physical symptoms that are believed to occur for a psychological cause. Now, as a neurologist, I see seizures and sleeping sicknesses like this all the time. I can't tell you how common they are. I see them every day of my working life, seizures that have a psychological cause. I also understand completely why these people rejected this formulation because despite a lot of medical progress, many people still sort of conceptualize this disorder in a very disparaging way. You know, it's thought to be synonymous with a psychiatric or mental illness, which is not. It's, it's universally explained by stress people refer to as madness. A lot of people still can't tell the difference between a psychosomatic disorder and pretending to be sick. And in the case of young women like those in Sand Creek, you know, people who are caught up in these outbreaks are still likened to um, Salem witch trials. So I understand why people reject the formulation. And I too am partially guilty, certainly as a, a junior doctor for propagating the sort of reductionist attitudes to these sort of disorders. You know, although this is so common, I was never given any formal training on how to approach one of these sort of disorders when I met them. I only had a single hypothesis and that was a hundred years old and it came from Freud, which was that these were sort of the manifestation of hidden psychological traumas that were being converted into physical symptoms. I only had a stress hypothesis for the symptoms. So when I told patients that their symptoms were stress related and they told me they were not, I invariably fell into the trap of thinking, well, they must be in denial, which was not a very fruitful conversation between patient and doctor and often led nowhere. And that was a long time ago that I sort of had this singular formulation. I've learned now over time that these disorders are actually not a single disorder. They have multiple different mechanisms and that stress is not the only way that a psychosomatic disorder can develop. So I want to just kind of present you with some sort of small thought experiments that will just hopefully demonstrate how easy it is for us to lose control of our bodies, even if we have no particular trauma or stresses. So first of all, I want to ask you to imagine that I have asked you to walk on a thin line on the ground and just to, to remain walking in a straight line, assuming that a person is well, hasn't had too much wine to drink. Most of us would do that with no difficulty whatsoever. 
But now if I asked you to walk exactly the same line, but at the top of a high wall, you know, immediately a lot of people would struggle to keep their balance. Walking and movement is supposed to be automatic. And the minute we start paying undue attention to it, it becomes less fluid and it threatens the quality of those movements. Sports people sort of um, experience this all the time. You know, you can completely destroy your sports game by changing the way you hold a racket or changing the way that you kick a ball. Sensation is also completely changed by undue attention to our bodies. So again, if I say to people, you know, at this moment as I'm talking, pay attention to how your feet feel. If you're anything like me, you'll immediately feel that sort of your feet are beginning to tingle because we don't normally think about how different body parts feel. They just exist on their own and they function without us having to think. But when we do start paying attention to them, we notice things that normally are filtered away. And once we notice things, they can be hard to unnotice. This is similar with awareness. Again, I will ask you just to imagine that you've had a phenomenally busy day at work and that you come home and someone you know the person you live with is trying to give you instructions and in something you're not terribly interested in and they can talk to you and not a word will go in or you can read a page of a book and you get to the bottom of the page of the book and you realize you haven't regist registered anything you've read this is a process called dissociation which is designed to protect us against overload and um, intrusive thoughts but when it goes wrong, it can produce things like sleeping sickness and seizures. And so the point really is that we've got all these unconscious processes going on that allow us to kind of act automatically. There's more going on in the unconscious brain than in the conscious brain. And the purpose of all these cognitive mechanisms is to make us efficient and to keep us safe in the world and to make us focused, but they can go awry. And it doesn't take very much for them to go awry and it doesn't re rely on psychological trauma. It could be just a factor of the attention one pays to our body or how one notices or uses one's body differently. And that might be provoked by something very small, like an injury, like believing one is exposed to a poison as the Krasnogorsk people did or being caught up in a pandemic. So over time, I've come to realize that sort of psychosomatic symptoms develop in a kind of a multitude of ways. And that allows me to kind of present them to my patients in an individualized kind of way. So that for some people, the stress hypothesis works well because their symptoms are related to an activation of the stress pathway. But for other people, the mechanism may be very different. However, this is where my point builds to somewhat of a, a sort of decrescendo, which is that even with multiple new ways of thinking about psychosomatic symptoms, conceptualizing them in a more biological way or a physiological way, I still encounter endless numbers of people like those in Sand Creek and those in Krasnogorsk who simply struggle to believe in the existence of this problem. And kind of knowing that no matter how carefully I explain things, I cannot get through to everyone has always made me realize that there is still something that I must be missing. And really I had to go to Kazakhstan, I had to meet Lyubov to kind of begin to, to think of what that something might be. So in 2019, I traveled to Krasnogorsk and I met um, Lyubov in her home. And she told me an incredible story that allowed me to see the sleeping sickness really differently. First of all, Krasnogorsk used to be a very special place. During the Soviet era, it was a uranium mining town that was under special protection from Moscow. And um, the people there lived in these kind of amazing modern apartments that were, you know, nestled in lush kind of gardens. They had cinema, they had a, a modern hospital, they had creches, cultural centers, their shops stocked products that didn't exist anywhere else in Kazakhstan. So as Lyubov told me, she lived in paradise and she meant that literally. But then, of course, the Soviet Union broke up in 1991. Kazakhstan sort of lost its um, was no longer in the Soviet Union. Krasnogorsk lost its special protection from Moscow, and that changed everything. The mines shut down. The people lost their jobs. People started gradually leaving Krasnogorsk, and services started to be withdrawn. Um, but there was a kind of a core group of people who just couldn't bear to leave. So they spent 20 years in a dying town to the point that some didn't even have running water. But that is not what made them sick. They survived that 20 years. They were a hardy people. The sleeping sickness didn't come until the government decided they wanted to relocate the remaining residents 
into a new town. This for the people, it was sort of like a, a sort of a love affair that had sort of was once wonderful and had broken apart. And they simply were struggling to, to kind of cut that last tie. And the sleeping sickness seemed to come along as to kind of give them permission to leave a town that they loved and that had served them so well. The Sand Creek story also had considerably more nuance once I had the opportunity to kind of hear it in more detail. It was important to understand what was happening to the girls, to understand their lives. So in um, remote areas of Guyana, these particular people lived with a different sort of um, kinship structure to us. Women stay within the village and do all the work in the village and the men go away to work. Kinship depends on proximity rather than on blood ties. Also, the people learned in a very different way to us. They learn through embodied learning. So they learn through proximity and participating and being involved rather than by instruction. So what had happened by taking the, um, the teenage girls away from the villages and putting them in the boarding school is it had completely dismantled these people's kinship structure. It had stopped the girls from learning the skills within the village that they would normally learn just by their presence there and the book learning that they were getting in school was useless to them in the future. So really when Granny came along, she kind of solved a very um, significant social dilemma for them. She kind of allowed the children to um, kind of make the counterintuitive move to, to leave aside the education that they did want and to, to go home. So in both these cases, although these people technically had mass hysteria, they did not have symptoms because of a sort of contagious stress um, and anxiety. It was not provoked by fear. Similarly, they didn't have a, a, a psychosomatic disorder in the sense of the Freudian sense. They were not having physical symptoms that were arising through hidden traumas um, converted into, into physical symptoms. Um, it was sort of, you know, they were under stress. But what was going on at an unconscious level was much more complex than just a simple sort of conversion disorder. But also, I would say that my particular sort of biologizing, you know, using physiology and examples to explain what was happening to them, that wasn't actually very useful to them either. So any sort of new ways I've learned to talk about these disorders was useless because these people did not want to know that their physical symptoms were could potentially have a psychosomatic cause and it was obvious why because these symptoms had come along to solve um, a significant social problem for the people and to try and force them to kind of take on my way of thinking was in every sense really threatening these sort of very complex sophisticated unconscious mechanisms at play in these communities you know i sort of um you know, these young women, they didn't want to um, leave the school, but they knew that they had to. And similarly for the Krasnogorsk people, they, um, they loved the town, but they knew that they had to leave it. So the symptoms served a purpose for them. And I came to realize that like not every problem can simply be solved with a sort of logical list of pros and cons. You know, it was naive of me to think that one can kind of biologize everything and it will immediately make sense because there are some problems that are too hard to contemplate. And for those sorts of problems, these sort of sophisticated kind of elegant unconscious mechanisms can actually be incredibly useful to people. I think ultimately what I learned from these communities is that I need, when I encounter patients who aren't of my mindset when it comes to sort of biology and physiology and, and don't accept my explanations, that I need to listen to the story that their symptoms are trying to tell me. You know, these people embodied a narrative that kind of led them through a quagmire of a problem to a solution. So perhaps I need to sometimes kind of stand back and sort of listen to my patient stories and allow them follow their own stories to their own conclusions. And I suppose the only question now is whether I, as a sort of um, very kind of meddlesome trained sort of Western medical doctor who is forced to take symptoms literally, whether I can actually do that for my patients. Thank you. Suzanne, thank you so much. That was a magnificent talk. And um, thank you for the incredible um, book and this amazing journey that you've been on um, researching it. It's an extraordinary thing to hear about. And I hope that everyone will pick up a copy of The Sleeping Beauties. And thank you for all the work you do in the NHS as well. And we will see you again very soon. Um,
and such an honor now to also introduce our third speaker this evening, um, truly multi-talented and um, internationally acclaimed artist and potter and writer. And he's coming to us from his studio um, in South London, which is fantastic for us. Um, he did speak before with us at 5 by 15 about The Hair with Amber Eyes, which was his acclaimed family memoir, um, chosen as one of the books of the decade by the Sunday Times and one of the books of the 21st century by The Guardian. But now he's back with another extraordinary family saga and story that he has uncovered, um, a very unusual and beautiful book, Letters to Commando. And welcome, Edmund, and thank you very, very much for making time to be here with us this evening and over to you. Thank you. So I'm back in Paris. I'm in the 8th arrondissement, back in the Parc Monceau, that beautiful park, walking around those streets created in the 1860s and 1870s, streets and hills full of golden stone, streets where families came from all over the Levant, all over Europe, came to become French. And I'm at the top of the hill, the top of the Rue de Monceau, and I start to walk down. And I pass our old family house, 81 Rue de Monceau, and look up at the top apartment where Charles Frissy collected all those extraordinary impressionists, Annette and I give the house a okay. proprietorial pat as I go past. And I keep walking, and as I walk down this street, I'm conscious of all these families, these great cousinships and clanships that have emerged of families, Jewish families from all over Europe who have married and settled in this street. And I reach number 63 and I go through the great gates of the Musée Nissim de Camondo and I cross the courtyard and there is an extraordinary discreet golden house like the Petit Trianon. And I walk across the courtyard and open the doors and start going up a beautiful, great curved staircase. I avoid all the great suite of rooms full of tapestries and bronzes and amazing French furniture and pictures all those great suites of rooms, the libraries, uh, the porcelain rooms. And I keep going up until I find the service stair metal stair going up three more stories up into the attics and the attics are silent these are the old servants rooms the rooms which were kept by the valets where the food was prepared where the furs were kept where the linen was kept i open one cupboard and find extraordinary luggage from the 1920s i open another one and find stacked up 1915 light fittings, and I find an archive. I find ledger on ledger from banks. I find hunting records and wills and memoranda and menus. I find extraordinary letters marked received and sent. I find all the detritus of a whole family and a dynasty. And every single piece of paper that I pick up has a different weight to do it, a different scent to it, a different feeling, a different sense of who it's come from and why it's stored. It's a whole world that's arrived and kept in this lock room high up in this house on the Rue de Monceau. I find a letter from Proust. I find ledgers of acquisitions. I find the minutiae of this particular family. And I find a silence and I start to write. I start to write letters from this silence and I start to write them to the owner of the house, the person who created this house, the Comte Moise de Camondo. The Camondo family came from Istanbul, from Constantinople, another Jewish dynasty like my own that had come from Odessa. They arrive at exactly the same time, the same month in the Rue de Monceau, and they build a huge pair of houses there, which Balzac and Zola decry as being monstrosities. And Moise is a good Jewish boy. He marries the right girl from the right dynasty, Irene Khan d'Anvers, another dynastic Jewish family. And they have two lovely children, Nisim and Beatrice. 
and then they separate. She runs off with her riding instructor, a rather raffish man with a monocle. And Moise, Moise grows up to become French. He inherits this extraordinary house. And when his parents have died, he pulls it down. He tears it down and he sells off all the extraordinary furnishings and paintings of, of minarets and bazaars that they'd filled their house with. He, sell, he sends all the Judaica, the oratory that they had, they were very pious, off to the Musée de Cluny. He sells off his father's tie pins, an exact donation to the Musée des Arts Décoratifs. And this perfect Frenchman starts to collect. He starts to collect all the things that he will bring to life, the life and vigor of the 18th century. He wants to make a small palace in Paris for that particular moment of great conversation and assimilation, that moment when Paris opened citizenship to the Jews, 18, 1791, that moment when Napoleon decrees that Jews are allowed to become citizens of a European country, an extraordinary moment. And then during the first war, Nisim, his only son, Nisim is Hebrew for miracle. Nisim, who's joined up, is killed in a flying accident. He's an aviator. And Proust sends this letter of condolence. And finally, his body is found. And the house changes. Moise is taken over by this idea that he will create a house which will then become a memorial for his son. It's an act of mourning, an act of grief. I still think he thinks that his son will walk across that courtyard, come in through those doors and join him at the dinner table. And while the world of Paris looks at these families, all these families, and there is that roiling, roiling anti-Semitism, the daily caricatures, the descriptions of the Camondos, the Afrisis, the Reinachs, all these families as inauthentic, parvenu, people who don't belong in France, people who are taking our patrimony. He carefully, delicately, lyrically, and in an act of mourning, puts together this house where one object can sit with another and make a kind of poetry, a poetry about the enlightenment, a poetry about that moment when French literature and music and art talked about conversation, about disagreement, about the possibility of a new world, of equality, and he carefully builds this house. And in 1935, he dies and it's willed to France. And in 1936, on a winter's day, Beatrice, his daughter, who's married a lovely composer, Leon Reinach, cousin of my grandmother's, a delicate composer of work inspired by Fauré. And their two young children, one training to be an ebonist training to make furniture in the manner of the 18th century. And Fanny, who is a horsewoman like her mother, gather in the courtyard and there is a book, a catalogue of the Musée Nissim de Camondo handed over on that beautiful winter day to France as an act of gratitude in memory of a lost son and to say how grateful they are to France. And on the 11th of June, 1940, Paris is declared an open city. And on the 14th of June, the Wehrmacht walk into Paris unopposed. And on the 16th of July, 1940, Vichy, France passes its first denaturalization law. And on the 27th of September, 1940, there is the first census of the Jews. And every day, there are new edicts. There are new laws about where you can sit, what you can buy, whether you can own a transistor radio or a bicycle. 
that you should order your own yellow star by going to the prefecture and with your clothing rations. And there is the roundup of children by French police. And there is the slow attrition of all the Jewish families in Paris and in France. And these Camondo family, my cousins, they write and say, we've given this to France. We're French, we're here. And they write to the people they know, the other members of the Gratin, the people they've hunted with, the people who've come to dinner and they don't receive replies. And they're taken to Drancy, to that deportation camp on the edges of Paris, guarded by French police. And on the 30th of November, 1943, on Convoy 62, Leon Reinach, Fanny and Beatrice, his two children, are deported to Auschwitz. And on the 7th of March, 1944, Beatrice Camondo, Reinach, Convoy 69, is deported to Auschwitz and they are murdered. And the house, the Musée Nissim de Camondo, a memorial for a lost son, is untouched. It's become a memorial to this whole family. It's become a place of extraordinary silence about belonging, about assimilation, about ownership. Who owns the rights to say that you belong here or don't belong here? All that conversation from Dreyfus, from Drummond, from those daily anti-Semites who say, day by day by day, you are unclean. You don't have the purity to be authentically French, your accent isn't right. You might buy French art, you might ride to hounds, you might write beautiful French music, but you are not French. So I write to Moïse de Camondo, I write to him here in this room, in the silence of last year, to his silence unanswered letters. And I write to him about food and dogs and books and about collecting and pleasure and Chardin and Proust and looking after your family and what it is to create a memorial and look forward to something enduring, something that goes on. And he doesn't write back, but I write them. And I write to him about my own family and belonging and my own mixed up, complicated life. I am a quarter Dutch, a quarter Austrian, half English, brought up in the Anglican church. I am a sort of Quaker. I'm a sort of lapsed Jew. I am a Buddhist by inclination, I make pots out of a fragile material. I'm completely European. And so I just write letters out to him and it's become a book. And that's my letters to Camondo. Thank you. Edmund, um, I, had, I don't know what to say. That was so extraordinary and incredibly powerful, poetic, beautiful in every way. And just thank you so much for, for coming to speak to us about this extraordinary book. And I hope that everyone will get a copy of Letters to Commando. We do have some signed um, editions with New and Bookshop and um, just incredibly profound. And thank you so, so much. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so after that extraordinary talk, it is our great honour to introduce the brilliant Horatio Clare, 
Um, Horatio is a, a great friend of ours at 5 by 15. He's a best-selling author, a broadcaster, and a former BBC arts uh, radio producer. And he's spoken at 5 by 15 before at the Tabernacle about an amazing and extraordinary journey he took on board a container ship, which I absolutely loved. Um, you may have heard Horatio's incredible um, slow radio sound walks for BBC Radio 3, which I urge everyone to listen to. And his latest book is a deeply personal one. It's called Heavy Light, A Journey Through Madness, Mania and Healing. And we are very honoured and pleased to have you with us uh, to talk about this. Um, and welcome, Horatio. Thank you. Thank you, Daisy. Um, thank you very much for having me. Uh, and good evening, everybody. And thank you for coming. Uh, I'm going to try and change the way you think about mental health in 12 minutes, not because I'm a campaigner or a zealot, uh, but because in the last couple of years, I've experienced some things and learned some things that have convinced me that as a society, as a civilization, we've taken a harmful wrong turn and that we can right it uh, simply by changing the way we see and think. So how better to begin a revolution than with five by 15? When I did that one before, it struck me what a influential, powerful, and interesting audience you are. So that's the flattery, here comes the revolution. I would ask you to cross your fingers if you've ever had insomnia, the kind that seems to claw your stomach as you lie in bed. And cross your fingers if you've ever suffered anxiety, that kind of panicked bird trapped in the chest or the hairy worm in the stomach. Cross your fingers, if you've ever had depression. Cross your fingers if you've ever suffered from grief, that kind of gaping, aghast misery that says that nothing will ever be quite the same again. If you've run out of fingers, cross your toes if you've ever had a delusion or uh, a vision or heard a voice that was only in your head. And cross your fingers if you've ever lost your reason over someone else, if you've known the madness of lovers. I suspect that most of us, if not all, have crossed fingers now. And I want to propose that these are all forms of madness. The root meaning of madness in proto-Germanic is changed for the worse, but we understand what it is, not quite of the daily world, uh, not quite rational, not quite sane. The point is that degrees of madness are part of all of us. Um, shades of madness are one of the sets of normal reactions we have to the stormy business of existing and making our ways through our human lives. If you subject any one of us to a particular set of circumstances or stimuli, we will be changed for the worse. We will experience degrees of madness. So far, perhaps so self-evident. Um, and now this is why it matters. The way we treat madness now in all these different degrees and versions does not accept what I have just said. We do not in practice locate changed for the worse in the circumstances of a life. If you go to a doctor or a psychiatrist because you can't sleep or you're depressed or you're anxious or you're cracking up or you're paralyzed by grief, or as I was, you are manic and deluded and mad as a bag of snakes, there may be some brief discussion about how and why you came to this place, but your treatment, unless you are very lucky, unless you are paying for it notably, will be the same. You will be treated for a deficiency and imbalance here in your head. You'll be treated as though there's something wrong with your brain and you'll be prescribed chemicals, psychiatric medication to change your brain. And the drugs you take will change it. That is what psychotropic medication does. So the way of seeing here is binary. Over here are all the healthy people and over here is you with your changed brain. And here is a chemical bridge to bring you back to where everybody else is. So how do we resolve this contradiction between where we started, that this is part of all of us, and overwhelmingly environmental, caused by trauma, life experience, injury, drugs, life events, circumstances, and where we are, which is that the mad with their brain problems are one group, and the sane are another with their different brains. I want to say that if you are taking, or have taken, or will take medication, I have only admiration for you. It can help, it does work. I don't want you to come off it. And I admire your courage for taking it, especially those people who take it principally for the benefit of those around them. When I needed it badly, it was the only thing that worked for me. I hope you will find the questions I'm about to ask doubly interesting. In the 1920s and 30s, you were more likely to recover from a breakdown 
than you are now. Why is that? If you are treated for severe madness, like psychosis or schizophrenia, under something called the Open Dialogue Programme, which was pioneered in Finland in the 1980s, you have an 80% chance of returning to work within two years, compared to about 15% in the UK under our treatment as usual method. The difference is that Open Dialogue uses little or no medication and a great deal of talk, and our method uses medication. Why is that? If you have had a breakdown and you do not take medication, you are more likely to be approaching full recovery after seven years than if you do. Why is that? In the decade 1990 to 2000, numbers of children diagnosed with bipolar disorder in the United States increased by 4,000%. Why is that? In the developing world, rates of recovery from breakdown and psychosis are better than they are in the rich developed world. Why is that? So I began the journey and it has been a literal journey with lots of travel and interviews and adventures, which led me to these questions on the locked ward of a mental hospital in Wakefield in Yorkshire, in the north of England, um, where I was detained for 17 days under section two of the Mental Health Act uh, in January 2019. And I remember the exact moment that it started. So over here, you have a man in a beautiful suit and expensive shoes, and he's got a lovely car in the car park and years of training, and he's got qualifications and experience and a good salary and total power over every patient on the ward. He's a responsible clinician. So without his say so, I'm not going to leave the building, never mind the hospital grounds. Uh, and if he wants me to be injected with medication because I won't take it, I can be held down and so injected. Um, he can put me on section three, which is a six month detention and infinitely renewable. Uh, in fact, he's got as far as I'm concerned. And over here in the worst haircut in the world, even worse than this one, in my terrible old clothes, which I'd been taken to the psychiatric hospital, wearing my friend's Crocs and with an infantile or zero understanding of the processes of mental illness, um, and having recently had a complete breakdown, during which I was uh, uh, as mad as a bag of hats, um, was me. And between us, there are these three pieces of paper, and he's giving them to me. And he says, aripiprazole, sodium valparate, and lithium. I want you to read these three pieces of A4, they've got two sides, NHS documents, and choose one. And you're going to take that to get out of here, and in, according to his prescription, long term. And I'm thinking, what the hell? You know, of the two of us in this situation, why is it me um, who's making this decision? Um, what can these three pieces of paper tell me, really? Uh, and what can they tell me about how these things work? And they list side effects. I mean, up to 20 for each drug, which would sort of summarize, which include early death um, uh, and symptoms of irreversible brain damage. Um, so I chose one to get out. And as soon as I had, I binned it uh, and I lied about it. Uh, and I lied to my nearest and dearest, and I kept lying. And I asked for a second opinion. Um, I saw a second psychiatrist who you're due to meet when you, you, you leave, who said the same thing. He took about five minutes looking at me and at my record, and he said I was bipolar, and he prescribed lithium long-term forever. Um, and then when I asked him for a second opinion, that got baffled refusal. I saw his, his boss sent me a message saying, go back and do what you're told. So why didn't I just do it? Um, because unlike most people who had been in that situation, I had documented, uh, because I'm a writer who bangs on about himself, my history, uh, particularly with cannabis. Uh, and I had a very bad history of cannabis triggering me and making me go high. I'd never had a high, and I mean a manic high, without cannabis use, and that would be followed by a low. And I was sure that that, combined with particularly kind of tortured life circumstances, had driven me over the edge. Um, and I thought I can change that. Um, but this didn't fit the official narrative, which says, according to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Diseases, pioneered by the American Psychiatric Insti uh, Association, that uh, cannabis use would come after, that users self-medicate. So although I had, you know, my own uh, history and story, um, that was discounted because it didn't fit the narrative. Um, and I'm not anti-psychiatry at all. Um, but that Diagnostic and Statistical Manual um, has been used over the past 50 years to diagnose everything from homosexuality to grief as brain disorders. Um, and in fact, the most recent version has been widely disowned and walked away from in the United States. However, 
they threatened me too. They said, you know, if you don't take this stuff, you're non-compliant. And if you're non-compliant, that means the next time you have a breakdown, you'll be on section three. And that is six months inside and it is infinitely renewable. So I went to London and I interviewed a third psychiatrist, a consultant psychiatrist, who gave me four times the time that the other two had. And he had no skin in the game. So they want to help. If I'd left the surgery without a pill and had harmed myself or somebody else, they're in coroner's court. And of course they want to help. But this chap wasn't responsible for me. And this is what he said. And as he told it to me, the whole story became astonishingly clear. Academic psychiatry, science-based psychiatry, and psychiatry in practice does not actually know how the majority of their drugs work. There are hypotheses, the dopamine hypotheses, the monoamine hypotheses, the serotonin hypotheses, none are proven. Psychiatrists prescribe by trial and error. So me being offered that effectively random choice was actually just being honest. They prescribe by side effect. Try something. If you have a bad reaction, try something else. Um, and if you have side effects, take these, they may offset it, which can lead and does lead overwhelmingly um, to polypharmacy, which is people taking handfuls of pills every day. So we have a whole multi-billion pound pyramid, sufferers taking them in ever greater numbers, psychiatrists prescribing them because they want to help by trial and error, and pharmaceutical companies marketing them and making them with staggering profits. And it's all based on a 1970s theory that there is a chemical imbalance in the brain of the sufferer. That theory has been debunked. Psychiatry now distances itself from it, but its legacy, its way of seeing, of intervening powerfully and semi-blindly and bluntly in the brain, that underpins and explains the situation that we are in. So it's worth remembering there is no chemical imbalance. And although you won't be necessarily told that, you're allowed to understand it. And for a sufferer's family, it's incredibly reassuring. There's something wrong with your brain, take a pill. Uh, and, and it's reassuring for you too. So I turned to psychology. And the therapists who treated me and whom I interviewed said they wouldn't take bipolar away from anybody if it was useful to them, but it wasn't interesting or useful to them. Um, the London psychiatrist incidentally said he thought my theory was uh, sensible and plausible, cannabis psychosis. So I've come to the conclusion that our way of seeing mental suffering as divisible into broad categories, all of which are treatable by drugs, despite the total lack of progress we have made in the prospects or numbers of sufferers or statistical outcomes serves, well, it serves uh, the pharmaceutical industry jolly well, it serves psychiatry as a profession, it serves sufferers' symptoms, but it doesn't serve our fundamental well-being at all. And yes, they do help people, these drugs, and they do save lives. And two doses of quetapine was all it took to drain real madness out of me. And of course, if psychiatrists had perfect pills, they would prescribe them. And many of the more progressive are moving away towards different kinds of prescriptions, which don't involve drugs necessarily. And I'm not anti-psychiatry or anti-medication at all. I am deeply and seriously anti-over-medication. Uh, and I'm a pro a whole new way of seeing. So. My second message really is drugs don't treat causes, they treat symptoms. So what should we do? I think we should scrap the category way of seeing. I think we should junk the chemical imbalance based approach. We should address causes, not symptoms. We should treat every sufferer, whether for anxiety or schizophrenia or as undergoing something entirely normal and explicable caused by their life history and circumstances. That is the first thing that Open Dialogue does. It says, Horatio, you've been dancing on someone's roof naked, you've crashed your car, you really believe you're engaged to Kylie Minogue, aliens are about to invade, world peace may break out if you keep this up. This is all normal and understandable given the situation that you're in and the pressures that you're under. So no one's treatment should be the same as anyone else's. Everyone in trouble needs therapy first and drugs second. Did you know that the National Institute for Clinical Excellence nowhere recommends the prescription of anything from antidepressants upwards without concomitant therapy? And no one should be taking drugs without therapy according to our own best practice, and yet millions are. So we're in an extreme situation, I think, with mental health. And in this extremist, we've abandoned our own advice. And I think that intervening, as I've said, 
blindly and powerfully in brain chemistry is not working for us. It is a chemical sticking plaster. So I would argue that we need to treat the whole person, your lifestyle, your circumstances, your history, your trauma, your body, your way of thinking. And all the stats say that this approach really works. I want to leave you with one thought. If you crossed your fingers earlier, it was not because there was anything wrong with you. Anxiety, insomnia, depression, psychosis, delusion, hearing voices. These things, according to therapies that really work, are a kind of language. They're your body talking to you, telling you there is something very wrong, perhaps catastrophically wrong. And you talking through those delusions and those behaviours and those experiences to a reality that you can no longer bear. But that doesn't make you odd or damaged or weird. It makes you normal and sensitive and in need. Find out what that need is, where that trouble lies, and address its causes, and it gets somebody to help you address them. And the main division in this whole story is between those who can afford therapy and those who can't, which anything that might lie in your far past or in your present life or both, and you will be on the road to healing. And if you want to know the full, mad, fascinating uh, inside story of what happened to me and what I found, you might read my new book, which is called Heavy Light, uh, and the point of which has been brought home to me in waves by people writing to me in the short time since its publication. And they're all saying, we need change now and we can change now. And too many people have died and had their lives wrecked by our current approach. It needs to be different and it needs to start now. So thank you very much and over to you. Please bring about this change. Horatio, thank you so much for being with us. It's so wonderful to see you looking so well and we're in awe of you being able to speak about these experiences and your generosity and wisdom. And, um, and it's wonderful to know how many people have been touched by this book. And I hope that more people from 5 by 15 will read Heavy Light and, um, and, and discover its ideas and start so much, building this campaign with you. Um, thank you. Um, and, and finally, this evening, um, it is uh, wonderful to be able to introduce our friend, Sam Lee, um, a Mercury Prize winning uh, singer, conservationist and uh, song collector, broadcaster and activist. Um, he's one of the most engaging people that I've ever met. And earlier this year, we were very lucky at Five for 15 to collaborate with Sam on a Singing with Nightingales evening and broadcast. And there is going to be another one of those tomorrow night, which is Earth Day. And I hope that you will be able to tune in and, and, and sing with Nightingales with Sam. Um, but tonight he's here to talk about his book, which is called The Nightingale Notes on a Songbird. And it looks at the myths, the poetry, and explores the conservation issues and why this bird that we love so much is also in so much danger. Um, welcome, Sam, and thank you very, very much for being with us. Um, over to you. Thank you, Daisy, and thank you, everyone, all the, the speakers for your amazing stories. Um, it's been some incredible journeys. I'm going to take you on a musical one to start off with and maybe have a little bit of songful breath. This is a, an old Sussex Southern English folk song called Birds in the Spring. One May morning early, I chance for to roam As I walk through the valleys by the side of a grove It is there I did hear those charming Bird sing. Did you ever hear so sweet? Did you ever hear so sweet? Did you ever hear so sweet as the birds? in the spring 
as I sat myself down to view all around. And the song of the nightingale, why he echoes all around. For his notes were so charming, his voice so sincere. No music, no songster, no music, no songster, no music, no songster, can with him compare. So all of you here, these small birds do hear, I'll have you pay attention, now listen, draw near, that when you've grown old, you'll have this to say that we never heard so sweet, that we never heard so sweet, that we'll never hear so sweet as the birds in spring. <laughs> That's the song Birds in the Spring from the wonderful Sussex family, the Copper family from Rotting Dean, who've been singing that song and many others of the great shepherding songs and songs of nature adoration for hundreds of years. And it really is in some ways a hymn to the music that we are hearing right now across the Northern Hemisphere with the awakening bird chorus, the dawn chorus, the evening chorus, and the return of many of our migrant species and the awakening of um, the great orchestra of birds. But really that song pays homage to the nightingale who for most traditional singers and most people who have spent time listening to birds, the nightingale really does um, sit as the pinnacle, as the principal bird, as the greatest singer of them all. Um, with one of the greatest ranges of, of, of vocal techniques, of phrases, of sounds, and the audacity to sing much throughout the day is in that song, um, but also most famously, the night song, the night wind from where the nightingale receives his name. And I say him because it is like with all the songbirds, it is the males that are singing that we're listening to. And the nightingale proves to be a really, extraordinary species um, that in many ways um, connects, I think, a little bit of so much of the stories that we've heard um, so far this evening with um, stories of grief and stories of survival and health and um, our evolution um, and uh, our mental well-being. The Nightingale seems to curiously sit as a, as a as a singer to us as a species, as a, um, as a teller of our tales, of our griefs, of our melancholies, of our joy, as our, of our tragedies, of our duplicitousness, and a bird that um, has become for generations who've lived in close attunement with the natural world as a teller of our lives and a reflector and a muse for some of the greatest artists and poets and instrumentalists that have ever um, sung and played upon this land. Um, the nightingale exists physically um, across the Northern Hemisphere. It, he's a very popular bird. Um, England um, is the most far westerly reach of his domain, extending all the way east into Western Mongolia Northern India, um, the Stans throughout Europe, Central Europe, um, and um, Spain and Western Europe, and a singer that returns annually from the Great Migration from Southern 
uh, sub-Saharan Africa. The English nightingales basing themselves throughout the winter in Senegal and Guinea-Bissau and Sierra Leone, making the tremendous journey. And these tiny little brown birds have made this journey for many tens, hundreds of thousands of years, perhaps have followed mankind um, on his uh, and her colonization of the world. Um, for they're a bird that is deeply associated with um, human impact on the land. They thrive upon the landscapes that have been, have been touched by human flame and human axe and um, and the, 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 the sort of practices that cause great flourishing of dense thickets and the messiness that uh, we have allowed for grazing animals to colonize and open up within prairies and scrub as um, is, has been very common. And thus the nightingale has sung to us as a species for many thousands of years and may even have worked their way into our, um, our sonic evolution, our musical evolution, um, for they are a bird that appear right now as spring is awakening, as the hungry gap is still there closing up awakening the, the, the re rejuvenation and the resuscitation of the land and our, the filling of our bellies upon the fruits and fats and vegetation of the land. So they are there as a principal clarion call for the, um, for the return of, of life, the revival of our land. And that impact um, has manifested in many, many cultures to have embraced the nightingale within their folklore and their folk song and their traditions within their poetry and prose. And we see all across the northern hemisphere within every culture a whole raft of uh, names for the bird, identifications and uh, acknowledgements within uh, the song from the oldest of the European um, music, that of the Iperian song and, and ceremony within the Epirus mountains in northern Greece that go back, we can uh, find evidence for over 8,000 years. There within their culture, the nightingale sings constantly in melancholy as a, as a calling of a sense of home, of zenitia, that sense of loss of, of place. Um, and there the bird has been the principal teacher for many of the instrumentalists the flautists and the clarinetists and the violinists. And indeed the whistle players originally, the scaros playing of the shepherds um, who would play their tunes upon the flutes made of the bones of birds, of condors and of um, vultures, I should say, and, and swans would learn from the nightingale, would uh, practice their techniques from their extraordinary dexterous um, uh, way with their improvising song, never repeating the same song over and over again, cycling through multiple different phrases, and also their extraordinary ability to improvise with humans, to interact, to take human song and playing and gesture, and to adapt their own and come into musical correspondence. I kid you not, I do it every night at this time of year. I'm off this very evening in my car to Sussex to bed down in the woods with nightingales in my very secret location, um, to start my own singing with them and my own communion, for it is an incredible journey into that nighttime landscape under the stars and these extraordinary blossoming nights to hear in the deep silence their um, amazing um, decibelage, 90 decibels in, in their prowess, but also their decoration of silence, which is what marks the nightingales as such artists with such a human quality to their phrasing, how they utilize the negative space, the silence. And this has been inspired and no doubt impressed itself within the tradition, traditions across Northern, Northern Hemisphere um, to uh, exemplify uh, what true artistry can sound like. It is said in, the, in, in Afghanistan, the master ruba players, the, the, the tar instrument that is um, the, the, the national instrument of Afghanistan, that those players who were marked out as being the true masters would have the ability while playing to the nightingales 
under a fig tree where the nightingales live there um, to lure the birds down to land on their tuning pegs who would then sing along with these players um, and so those stories are played over and over again of the inspiration of the bulbul um, or the, the nactigal or the rossignol singing to hearts and poets um, and so many stories are there that one can just spend hours and days recounting the incredible journeys and poets and uh, inspiration that has sprung forth. Indeed, in Britain, we have our apocryphal tale, a more modern day one where the nightingale uh, found himself within the first ever live broadcast on radio, uh, a, a world first, a real pioneering of, of digital technology and, and, and virality, virality of, uh, of, 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 a, of a concept when Beatrice Harrison, the muse to Elgar, played the cello in her garden in Surrey with the nightingale. Uh, for the first time microphones taken out into the woods and that became a, an international sensation repeated all the way through until the first the second world war in 1944 when uh, the, the nightingales were broadcast with the lancaster and wellington bombers flying over to Mannheim for a bombing raid in germany um, and uh, that broadcast was swiftly cancelled closed but the recording still exists as does some of Beatrice's recordings with the birds as testaments to moments where um, this song songster has found his way into popular culture. The tragedy of this is that a bird that has been such a huge inspiration for generations, eras, cultures, um, certainly in the UK, is swiftly coming to an end for we expect the nightingale to fall silent on this island within the next 35 to 40 years at current rates of decline. So the bird is now becoming um, a symbol of the decimation, the dissolving of our environment, the depletion of our na nature, of our species being lost, particularly our birds who are in many ways the canaries in the mind to the, um, the, the great tragedy and treatment that we are, uh, are are doing unto our own soil um bad farming practices overpopulation of deer the insect crash are all contributors to the uh slow fade out of the nightingale um and so the book that i've written the stories that i tell of my own experiences my own journeys and my intimacy with this bird spending six weeks a year in close counsel with this uh, this incredible singer um, has shown me what a powerful and healing force nature can be and how much we must fight to save the nightingale, the turtle dove, the cuckoo, um, the mayflies, all the, the spirits, our cousins, our brother creatures uh, and sister creatures that um, we live in in, uh, in close proximity to what a duty we have to save them for we are and our survival is inextricably bound. We lose the nightingale, we lose a little bit of ourselves and eventually who knows what then. So um, the nightingale really is a creature worth saving because if you save them, you save um, everything that they depend upon and live in connection with. So um i will leave you there um to say thank you for listening and uh i hope that some of you if you have access to go and find a chance this spring to um to pay your respects to the nightingale or another species you're close by to um maybe international dawn chorus day or earth day tomorrow to go and spend some real quality time um and the healing power of nature for birds are one of the greatest uh, balms to our souls and weary spirits, particularly after a winter like one we've just had. So thank you all of you for listening. Thanks to all the other speakers and to Daisy and Rosie and uh, Stephanie and the whole team. Sam, thank you so much. That was beautiful and what a fantastic way to 
finish this extraordinary evening and um, I hope that everyone will get a chance to listen to Nightingales with you and one of your incredible broadcasts from the forest with musicians um, and also to get a copy of your book The Nightingale Notes on a Songbird. Um, I know that Newham Books do have some signed um, copies available and of course it's Earth Day tomorrow so we'll be thinking about your story and your call to arms um, as we go forward. So um, thanks, just profound thanks from me to all of our incredible speakers this evening. It's been one of those extraordinary evenings and, um, and there have been hundreds of people tuning in. So thank you all for being part of this. Um, thank you to Sam, to Horatio, Edmund, Suzanne and Walter for their stories and their work. And I hope that we can support them by getting copies of their books and talking about the issues and ideas that they have raised this evening. Um, all of it was so thought provoking and, um, and just very inspiring for us. So good night from 5 by 15. We will see you again very soon. Stay safe and well and thank you.